Hi, Logos Legacy here. Today, I'm interviewing Emerald from the Diamond Net podcast and YouTube channel. Emerald's content is an interesting blend of Jungian psychology and New Age mysticism that may well be familiar. Emerald helps people heal from trauma and illusion. She even utilizes tarot in innovative ways too. I've really been looking forward to this conversation, so I hope you enjoy. Awesome, Hi. thank you so much for having me, Nick. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure as well. So, I've seen on your website, you give a sort of explanation as how you came to this, but for the uh, viewer or listener, could you explain how you awakened, so to speak, and came to here? Sure, absolutely. So basically, if I'm going to go way back, um, basically as a child, I always had a, a contemplative nature, you know, so I was always trying to like kind of like ask questions about reality and, you know, I always had, you know, questions about how things were. Um, but basically the main awakenings, I would say, happened when I was 20. Um, I had two ayahuasca experiences spaced like five months apart, and each one of those opened me up to, uh, basically, I had a certain way of thinking about things before I had those experiences, I got some distance from the ego, I recognized that there was a lot of self-deception going on, I recognized that a lot of the things that I thought were my best qualities, some of them were like rooted down in some deep traumas of mine. Um, and basically after these two experiences, again, five months apart, a lot of like, a lot of the structures in my life started to fall away. You know, I used to pride myself on always like being like successful and being resilient. And basically after the first experience, things started to really rapidly change. And on a more practical level, I think it was just that I couldn't go back to the, the ignorance of being able to lie to myself and being able to maintain the, the way that I was living before that, you know, because there was a relationship that I was in that was not a good relationship that I was very attached to. There were a lot of ways that I would think about like needing to get success. And it was all based on like my ideas of like, oh, I have to achieve this or do that to be existentially valid. And I got kind of a peek behind the curtain with the first experience and recognized that so much of my, my life was built on this kind of like almost a unstable or, or, or almost like rotten foundation based in a lot of trauma and a lot of compensation for that trauma. And five months later, after things started to fall apart and I was experiencing a lot of traumas and a lot of, um, you know, structures in my life just that I used to like rely on and really base my identity on started to fall away. And I stopped being able to like achieve for a while in the way that I was used to achieving. And, and basically there was just a lot of mess. And, and then I did the ayahuasca again, and there was this recognition that it wasn't the things that I did or didn't do that made me valid as a, a sentient being. What it was is this fundamental, um, just the way that the universe is, is that every single person, every single element of reality is like a, a thread in the infinite tapestry of everything. And there's the, this, let's say, being-based uh, validity that can't, be, um, that can't be shaken ever. So you can't do anything to make yourself more existentially valid or less existentially valid. There is just a fundamental validity just simply behind existing. And so after that had happened, it was such a stark contrast to the way that I would usually think about things that, and, and it really turned my entire um, framework on its ear and the ways that I would be usually used to coping with things, I could no longer use those as crutches. And, you know, like a big part of it was like, I used to be like a workaholic and really determining my, my worth based on like what I would produce and, and how well I would do. And I just couldn't find the motivation to do that anymore because I recognized it was coming from this other place. And I, I could no longer, once I had woken up to that, I could no longer go back to that same coping mechanism. So there was a few years where I really floundered in life. It was the very, you know, the earliest part of my 20s from like 20 to 23. During that time, I also became a parent. And you know, it was difficult to navigate adult life having had that big paradigm shift. And it took me three years again to start rebuilding my paradigm and start finding ways to reconcile, let's say, the more spiritual uh, paradigm that I'd experienced with ayahuasca with the ego transcendence. 
and then the more practical realities of everyday life. And a big part of that was I found Jungian psychology and I started reading a little bit of Jung himself, but other Jungian authors. And that started to give me a sense for which way was up and which way was down. It started giving me ways to like reconcile different uh, truths, let's say on the more spiritual paradigm with the practical paradigm. And then I really immersed myself in that for about a year. And then I started to resonate with other teachers, you know, basically like, and a big part of it was just integrating what I had experienced, you know, with, let's say my current practical everyday life so that I could get back grounded and that I could um, basically still be able to move forward in my life and to like live this life and to commit to this life like fully and committing fully to being Emerald while also being able to hold space for these other things that I've experienced and, you know, and basically a lot of it has had to do with growing out my framework for how to look at things. And so it's given me a lot of different perspectives that I didn't previously have. And then since then, basically, I've just been kind of on the path and like working a lot internally with myself, working with others. Um, I've had a couple more ayahuasca um, experiences, both of them in ceremony in the past couple of years. Um, you know, this is now 10, 11, 12 years later. And there's been a lot of shifts that I've had in regard to that as well. Um, done a lot of active imagination, done a lot of inner work, shadow work. I work with people with shadow work. So basically that's just kind of like a general, like at a glance snapshot of kind of how things have come to be the way that they are now for me, you know, from those experiences. Wow. So that was quite an answer. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was a good answer. I liked it. Thank you. So, um, I'm not sure where to start. Actually, <clears throat> something interesting is um, I looked on your website and something I haven't really discussed so much in um, on my podcast that much is the Myers-Briggs or the MBTI. Now, there is, I'm sure you've noticed a tendency for some people to get egoic identities based around it. Absolutely. Right. And I'm sure you did that with the whole INFJ thing. Because apparently that's what you relate to the most. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I did that with the INTP thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm not even sure if it's even meaningful. I don't even know if I would be that <laughs> anymore. But like, do you what do you what do you have to share about the MBTI and maybe its connection to the Enneagram in relation more broadly to Jung and the New Age sort of ideas? Gotcha. So I suppose with the MBTI, like, and like, I've noticed the same tendency of like, you know, there's like a strong desire to identify with it. I know that, let's say before I had my channel particularly, um, and when I felt quite isolated in the things that I had experienced, um, you know, now that I have my channel, it's, I, I, I have conversations with a lot of people who've had analogous experiences and analogous interests. But before there was this real sense of being like, the odd person out, like in my workplace, I used to be a public school teacher. And the ways that I would cope with it is by creating an identity of specialness. And I think like the, the whole INFJ like leads into like that identity of specialness because it's one of the more rare types of, you know, uh, personality types. And so it's like, you know, almost like there's that inner voice. It's like, oh, if they could only see that, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, that kind of thing. But once I actually found people who were like, you know, really resonating on the same wavelength, interested in the same things, there wasn't so much of a need to cope through that identity. So there wasn't as strong of a, an attachment to being an INFJ or, you know, basically any of the qualities that I would typically hold on to as the thing that makes me different and therefore special. And, you know, so I definitely think that, uh, that someone's MBTI type, especially if you have one of the less common ones can like really like give a strong sense of, oh, there's a specialness, there's, you know, something unique, something that can be created as an identity, but of course, with anything that creates a strong identity, you know, there's, it basically kind of boxes you in with regard to how you think of yourself. Now, in terms of uh, like the MBTI and the practical application of it, I think it's very, very helpful for allowing people to get, um, get kind of a systematic awareness of certain qualities they have, you know, and I think through the lens of Jung's cognitive functions, Myers and Briggs like really created this test and added the element of introversion and extroversion to it as well. And basically like, um, you know, sort of 
categorized these 16 different categories of people. Now, one of the things I've noticed is that I've known people who are, you know, very different people who fall in the same category. So it's like you're looking at four different facets of someone's personality. And this can be very, very helpful in the sense of being able to get a practical understanding of yourself and to others. You know, you can kind of get a sense for, like, let's say if I were a career counselor or something like that, you know, I could maybe by knowing someone's M MBTI score, I can kind of think like, okay, you know, what are the things that this personality type might be interested in going into? I also wouldn't want to get too blinkered in the sense that, you know, I've kind of boxed them in, but it can be helpful for things like this, very practical understandings of the self. Um, but of course, with every person, you know, there can be many different shifts that we go through in life. I remember I used to test out as an INTP at a certain point in my life and INFJ was, I feel more authentic to me, but basically the way that I was operating and the way I was orienting to the world was like an INTP. And so I think that there's a lot of flexibility with it, but there's also something that can show us uh, things about ourselves. Now, with your question about how the, um, let's say the MBTI and the Enneagram relate together, unfortunately, I don't know a ton about the Enneagram. So if you have any specific questions in relation to that, where you can give me some context for it, I can kind of think about like how I think that the Myers-Briggs um, might track onto the Enneagram or, you know, something like that. But I, I personally don't know a ton about the Enneagram myself. Okay, thank you. So that was helpful. Um, I was just kind of mentioning it just in case you knew the connection there, because um, I've been wondering it myself. Mm -hmm. um, so um, without going into too much detail, what can you say about the functions and their relation to both um, from a sort of Jungian branching off into new age perspective, but also in relation to archetypes. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so basically, like, when it comes to the eight cognitive functions and the way that, like, it's categorized through the lens of the MBTI, every, um, every one of the 16 personality types have their own stack, and basically four of the functions come out as their primary, um, the, the primary four um, that come into play, and usually those are based on either introversion or extroversion. So, for example, if I'm an INFJ, my dominant function, which means my first in that four, uh, four uh, function stack is introverted intuition, also called um, NI. You know, so basically I have NI and then I have FE, which is extroverted feeling. Then I have introverted thinking, which is TI, and then I have extroverted sensing. And it basically the most, do it goes from the most dominant to the least dominant within those four, uh, those four functions. So the way that I think about it is that it really shows like what qualities to focus on in terms of like, let's say the most dominant thing, you know, the, the primary thing that's going to come out and then sort of thinking about how the other functions are going to work in relation to that. So for me, my dominant thing is introverted intuition, it means like a lot of insights come up from the inside and basically being able to really tune into that being the first um, being the first order of business. And the second thing is being able to bring that more extroverted with extroverted feeling, making connections with other people, um, you know, being able to attune to other people and this sort of thing on a more emotional level. And then I go back to introverted thinking. And with introverted thinking, introverted thinking is basically being able to make sense of things internally. So with an INFJ, particularly with the NI and the TI, it's kind of like taking all of that intuitive stuff that comes up and being able to organize it and systematize it. And that's my tertiary function. So it's the third in the stack. And then my, um, my least dominant function within the four is extroverted sensing, which means being here, noticing, you know, sensory experiences, being very attached to uh, or connected to the, the sensual experiences of things. And so within every person, depending on, you know, what their MBTI type is, they have a certain function stack. Now, I don't know any of the others, like, right off the back of my hand, like the way that I know my own cognitive function stack, but basically, you have a dominant, a secondary, a tertiary, and then you have the fourth function, which is the least dominant, and so basically, it's sort of showing the trajectory that the personality and the individuation process tends to go within. So you start with your most dominant, and then you move down that spectrum. And so when it comes to, let's say, 
you know, let's say the development in relation to certain archetypes or certain common forms that come across all cultures and societies. Let's say that somebody who is an INFJ, you know, has sort of like maybe something of the, uh, you know, the counselor, you know, or the, 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 like, let's say the, the wise person or something like this, you know, so when it comes to that, if we can think about it through the lens of that, um, that archetype, you can kind of see like, okay, if I'm going to develop my introverted intuition, how would this archetype tend to do that? And I can maybe find those qualities within myself. Is that the high priestess? Yeah. So the high priestess would be a good example, like in the tarot, you know, so the wise woman comes through there, you know, so basically, Anything that has to do with an awareness of what's going on internally, which is that wise woman archetype or the high priestess, or even some elements of the hermit can come into play with that as well. And basically that internal awareness, things going on, like let's say in the mind, in the emotions, and the connection to that tends to come through with particularly IN types, you know, but INFJ, I know specifically is like more geared towards sort of a counseling role because of the FE, you know, and that connection to other people. And so basically, if I'm going to think about my personal growth in relation to my cognitive function stack and in relation to that archetype of the wise woman, I can sort of think about, okay, how does this archetype start to develop each of those functions? The introverted intuition starting first, then extroverted feeling, how does that archetype then go to orient toward other people and get that more uh, emotional attunement. And then how are they thinking about the intuitions that are coming up? So creating that distinction between the introverted intuition, the introverted thinking, and then also getting back in touch with the external, which is something that for somebody who has introverted intuition and introverted thinking can be a little bit of a challenge because, you know, it's such an internal sort of archetype. So I would say that relative to anyone's uh, MBTI type and their cognitive function stack, they can start to think about, well, what, what's the general archetypes that might, might relate back to this cognitive function stack? And if I'm developing myself in relation to that archetype, how would this archetype go through that? So does that kind of answer your question? It does. It was very it, detailed. Uh, I like it. So where does that fit into shadow and integration of the shadow which is, i guess involves integration of opposites gotcha so this is why it would be very important to like hold on very loosely to mbti type and other indicators of personality like that so mbti and other personality type indicators are really good for getting insights about the self and good for getting insights about how to go through that process of individuation and growing the self out. But if we hold on too tightly, what ends up happening is that we can kind of get a narrow or constricted kind of sense of like our personality. So our identity might kind of shrink to just that. So if I hyper identified with being an INFJ, let's say, I would be like, oh, anything that would be opposite to or antithetical to the INFJ, I would push away perhaps because my self-concept would be contingent upon being an INFJ. So if I was really attached to that, I wouldn't be able to allow in any kind of extroversion or I wouldn't be able to allow in any sensing or, you know, these other parts of myself. Can I come in here? Sorry. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if that connects with the idea of a more narrow identity would actually create more separation and boundaries between you and others, mm -hmm. as opposed to broadening out your sense of self to include potentially everything. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so that's a great point. So basically, and I forget which video I put this in, but basically when it comes to the shadow, I said the first thing that becomes in shadow is whenever we make the distinction of this is me and everything outside of me is not me. So there's a disidentification that comes up that kind of puts things in sort of the dark closet to where we no longer identify with those things. We can no longer see ourselves as connected to those things. And so we can take that as meaning with regard to our particular traits that we feel are antithetical to our identity. But the very first identity decision that we make is I am self and that is other, you know, so creating the distinction between self and everything else, which is essentially an illusion. Okay. I'm going to go a little bit controversial here. So, um, what was Hitler's um, personality type, and was it INFJ? I like I'm not 100 sure. I have like you know read different lists of like you know like what you know what personality type each one has, and I think I've seen him like put under the INFJ. I suppose 
given that I don't know a lot about his personality, like it's hard for me to say, I guess I could look at the way that he would orient to things. I guess he seemed, I guess if I'm thinking introversion or extroversion, uh, I don't know how he was in a personal sense, but he does seem like extroverted in the sense that he was like, you know, like a very, uh, let's say he would do a lot of public speaking, but that doesn't necessarily mean that someone's an extrovert. That might be a um, shadow thing, like a shadow extroversion. Maybe, possibly. So basically, if somebody would be, if somebody had, let's say, a part of themselves that was extroverted in the shadow, it might come out in like other ways. Like, so maybe the person would be kind of like socialized, um, um, isolating themselves socially, but then like maybe in certain situations, they would become really attention seeking. So it could be, a, a lot of it's conjecture though. It's, it's really hard yeah. for me to pin that down because mostly like, just from the historical knowledge of Hitler, it's, it, I don't know about his personality. I just know the things that he did, you know. Okay. And, okay. So it's hard for me to hard for me to. The reason I brought it up was actually bridging towards this other thing we could explore, which is what um, Carl Jung described as mass psychosis or mass neurosis. It, I think he, in a nineteen forty five paper, he was. I think he was. I don't know if you've read it. I imagine you have. He was explaining the psychology of the Germans and why they would support Hitler and what was going on there, but more broadly what was going on in the West in general and how mm -hmm. like in like um, Native Americans explain or people in other parts of the world explain that quote, the white man has a crazy look in the eyes. Mm. That's the sort of thing they said. And I've got a theory about what's going on that it relates to a sort of collective death throes of the ego in the collective shadow and stuff. Um, what do you think about that? Gotcha. So I definitely think whenever there is something that's happening in the collective that we could kind of track on the, uh, you know, the individual psychology and we can see it playing out in the, you know, in the broader sense. Now, in terms of what was happening, you know, in, you know, Nazi Germany and this kind of thing and in Europe at the time, the way that I see it is, or the way that I would typically describe it is sort of through the lens of what you can have on an individual level is codependency and narcissism, but played out on, let's say, a societal scale, what you have is you have that same dynamic playing out only with like larger groups of people and on a more macrocosmic level. So basically, when you're dealing with the individual kind of sense of codependency and narcissism, you basically have the narcissist that comes out and poses themselves as some kind of authority figure, and they do so to hide certain vulnerabilities in themselves. And then the codependent basically comes to doubt themselves and feel like they have to externalize their personal sovereignty onto another person. And so what you get in a relationship like that is you get one person who's more on the narcissistic side of the, the spectrum acting as the authority and you have the more person on the more codependent side of the spectrum sort of leaning on that authority and utilizing that authority to make decisions for themselves. You know, and so in, in, and in the aftermath, you know, whenever, you know, the people who were, you know, who were Nazis, who were, you know, supporting Hitler and, you know, all the things, they would say, oh, I'm just following orders, right? Yeah, so basically, they would say, I'm just following orders. And so when it comes to that, we could think about, let's say, Hitler kind of playing the role of, like, the demagogue, you know, which is sort of, it's an intonation of that narcissistic side of the spectrum of saying, I'm the authority. And, you know, when it comes to how he could, let's say, speak to the people, he was able to position himself in this authoritative kind of role. Of course, he was a politician as well. So that adds on to that, the kind of mystique around that. And basically what you had is you had a, a society that was like suffering and fundamentally unsure about themselves prior to that. So there was a lot of economic problems. And so basically Hitler could play the role of the narcissist or the demagogue and come up there and people would attune to him and kind of externalize their sense of a self onto him. So instead of making decisions for themselves, they would then say, oh, what is Hitler saying? And there was enough people in society that did that who were giving up their sovereignty to this demagogue figure, you know, that basically ended up creating a kind of societal 
wave in this very destructive direction. And so I think when it comes to this, what ends up happening is that which plays out on the individual level within a narcissistic and codependent relationship can kind of happen within uh, the broader societal context. But I will say that I don't think that this is specific to that time period or specific to a particular, um, you know, a particular place. I think that you can get that happening on many different scales and you see it happen on many different scales all the time. So for example, if we take things out of like the political and the historical spectrum, we could just imagine that there might be some celebrity that gets like a cult following. And ultimately, again, the celebrity is putting themselves out there as I'm the authoritative figure. And then they have an extreme degree of influence over the people who are codependent on them, who are looking at them as an externalization of their own sovereignty. And so when that person says, oh, you should do this or you should do that, you know, the people who are, you know, let's say have externalized their sovereignty onto that person because of that codependent tendency might end up kind of engaging in what could be called a mass neurosis. You know, they're engaging in following the leader essentially. And a lot of that has to do with the understanding that I don't know what I have um, to offer. I don't know what, let's say, uh, what would be the way? So if I'm operating from a codependent perspective, right? It's a sense that I have doubt in myself. I don't know what to do. I have to lean on another person to make decisions for me. It's looking for that bright and shining authority figure, that person that's going to make the decisions for you that tends to lead to these kind of mass followings. You know, and you could see it in cult right. leaders as well and, you know, all sorts of different places. So I think ultimately what was happening there is that, that mass neurosis was just that dynamic that plays out on these smaller scales happening on a much larger scale. Yeah, yeah, I largely agree with you. Um, and it's interesting, you get this dynamic on uh, in interpersonal basis, just when you get a narcissist and they'll have people who are basically uh, codependent with them, just reinforcing the identity. And they're like, oh, you're, you're amazing, you're amazing. I'll do anything for you even hurt those people, mm -hmm. um, right? You get this dynamic where someone might be targeted in some way, but that is just one example where, as you said, the same thing was going on in Nazi Germany. Um, and also I'm wondering about, you'll get this dynamic in a competing way where there'll be one circle and another circle competing. This might look like narcissists competing, or it might be competing ideologies. It might be competing nations, um, sports teams, competing spiritual gurus, exactly. um, religions. So this is a dynamic, very old, right? Exactly. Maybe it's intensifying before it dies. That's hypothetical. I, I'm inclined to say yes, but. And maybe it's intensifying so we can let go of it. But fundamentally, like, yeah, yeah. And it's clarified in my mind as well, the way I explained it. Um, so when it comes to different ideologies, you would agree that you can definitely see this and like, yeah, let's explore, what would you have to say about like ideology and how it fits into this whole thing? Well, basically, when it comes to ideology, like parsing a distinction between, let's say, genuinely held values, which, you know, people are going to have, and then following along, let's say, kind of paint by number by the book ideology. So basically, an ideology in the way that I would be viewing it means that here's a person that's probably usually someone who's an authority figure of some kind, you know, kind of taking on the perspective of I'm the expert, you know, and that sort of thing is they've put out some kind of like um, some kind of dogma, something that's understood to be absolutely true. Right. And they, you know, it doesn't matter what the dogma is, you know, it could be, let's say a belief in, let's say a particular religious structure, a particular political party. It could be, you know, you know, theistic, atheistic, like doesn't matter really what's. And it might look as really, really positive on the outside. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And you can have all sorts of ideologies and in a sense, on one level, you know, the values that we hold and, you know, 
basically the ways that we look at the world can come through an ideology. And in a sense, ideology and is sort of a technology, a technology for the way that we think about things. On another level, it can be sort of a dogma that people hold on to and begin to identify with. So again, it's the difference between using it as a tool versus using it as an identification. And whenever you have, let's say, a group of people who are believing in a particular ideology, what happens is that then you have the identification with the ideology and then a pushing away of whatever is opposite to that ideology. So let's say that we have two different ideologies. Let's say that you have on one hand, you have like a bunch of hippies that have like an anti-war ideology. And let's say that you have a bunch of people who kind of like see themselves as patriotic and they have like a pro-war ideology. So basically within that, each group is going to be hyper-identifying with the ideology and hyper-identifying with the figureheads that propose that ideology. Again, that expert that kind of steps up is in that sort of narcissistic role. And then what happens is that the in-group creates its own kind of rules. Like, oh, you can't be anything like the out-group, you know? So we have these two, again, ideologies that are fundamentally pitted against one another. So that means that not only are the people in the out-group, you know, from the perspective of whichever in-group you're talking about going to be judged and ostracized and everything, what you're also gonna have is you're gonna have each individual doing that same split within themselves where they hyper-identify with what the ideology reflects and they disidentify with anything that is, uh, let's say, uh, it, antithetical to that ideology. So let's say if we take the, the hippie group, the pro-peace group, and it becomes not just held values, but it becomes ideological and it becomes like a high control group, you know, with these almost like cult like figureheads, let's say it's just this really intense, you know, like coalescence around this ideology and everybody's identifying with it, right? So basically let's say that this person, you know, the person who's in the group identifies as being this peace loving hippie. Well, anything that's antithetical to being the peace loving hippie is gonna get pushed to the shadow. So any drives toward violence, any drives toward, uh, let's say anything that creates uh, disharmony in society or that kind of thing, they're not gonna be able to really see that in themselves because not only would that be an affront to their identity, it's also an affront to their belonging in the in-group. And us being a very social species, all of our survival is very wrapped up into belonging to the group we belong to. And so what ends up happening for people who get really hooked into ideologies and hooked into groups that are very ideological is that they end up in this spot where they can't really fully recognize certain elements of themselves without feeling extreme degrees of shame, feeling that potential for ostracism. And of course, it's the more ideological and the more identified people become with a certain ideology, is that it becomes uh, very difficult to in color outside of the lines in any way. And of course, there's like, you know, there's a spectrum here. So you could have a group that generally holds certain values and they have like certain ideas about like what they want to bring forward. And that's normal, like, you know, basically to have groups that are like, oh, let's, you know, let's end world hunger, you know, this kind of thing. But when it becomes an identity, when the ideology is like, really dug into, you know, and really um, held on to very tightly, what ends up happening is that it creates a real schism within the personality and a schism externally as well. So what's happening externally is also mirrored internally, where if people in group A are judging people in group B, internally that person's going to have judgments and, and sort of shadows with any qualities that they also possess that belong in group B. So yeah, so, so that can kind of happen on the internal level and on the external level. Okay. Um, yeah, again, uh, makes a lot of sense to me. Is identity politics inherently egoic? I wouldn't say inherently so, because ultimately there are going to be political things that come up that have to be addressed, like on a very practical level. So we have to be able to parse the distinction between identification and that identification, like, uh, let's say, obscuring certain realities and certain things. And basically the identity politics that, in the ways that I've seen it done, that 
create a lot of problems is like, oh, this person of this identity, you know, is going to, let's say, run for president or, you know, run for the Senate or something like that. But meanwhile, what's not being looked at is that they're bought off by these different mega corporations and that sort of thing. And so it sort of puts on like the face of here's like, you know, the face of diversity, but underneath that there's like corruption that's there. You know, so right. it can be kind of used in a cynical way that way. But let's say that there is, let's say, a group of people that are, let's say, being treated unfairly because of their identity. Whenever, let's say, political and social decisions are made in that sense, it makes sense because ultimately that's going to open things up so that we have a more fair society. So on one level, we can't completely take that perspective off of the table because there are a lot of things that if we look from the perspective of identity, we can start to see certain ways that society <laughs> that creates a lot of issues. On the other hand, it can be used cynically and in, in a sense of in-group and out-group identification. And basically that's where you sort of run into problems. So again, it's using it as a tool versus using it as an identity. All right, thank you. That was an interesting answer. I'm, I'm being slightly brave here because I know that my ego is slightly invested still. And I think a lot of us, the what we identify with before we get into spirituality doesn't immediately go away. Yes. Uh, right? Um, so, but I'll have a go. Because the last thing I'd want to do <laughs> would be get into... What was it fight or flight dynamic with you? <laughs> all right. I don't think that will happen, but all right. So what if what seems like a practical concern and a fundamentally descriptive matter can be understood from a skewed, in a skewed, distorted way due to ideological identification, even if it seems um, entirely ethical and reasonable. But I, I, I will add to this question where what if secondly, we can approach an issue without the egoic attachment, without an ideological attachment, without that distortion, and without being from the camp that claims to deal with that. Mm -hmm. In a unification of opposites, unifying left and right, let's say, mm -hmm. maybe then we could resolve these issues without there being a one side is completely right and the other side we're just bad people and do you see what i'm getting with this absolutely yeah most definitely and to address the first part basically there can be all sorts of different you know like whenever we hold tight to certain beliefs regardless of what they are they can create a kind of lens through where it might be difficult to actually see what's going on and so on that level i think having an underpinning of awareness that the the scope of our awareness as human beings is very limited and we're in a space of not knowing so many things and yet we still have almost not necessarily a moral obligation, but in a sense, being involved in, let's say, the social and political things, you know, are part of, let's say, living in a community. But we also can be aware that, you know, we are one perspective, you know, and there's no way that we could possibly know with any objective sense everything that's going on in the world. And so I think a lot of it has to do with coming back to that awareness of what is fundamentally unknown and being able to embrace the uncertainty of that. And once you get to the point where you can kind of like set aside any like viewpoints or ideologies and that sort of thing, and you look squarely at what's happening in front of you, you can start to make your best guess about what's going on. And basically 
what you have fundamentally, like just to go like further into like what you were saying with when it comes to left and right, they're just two different paradigms, two different viewpoints for viewing things. And ultimately underneath that, there are, well, basically beyond that, there are just many other different perspectives we could take as well. It's just that there's like a coalescence of these two different groups. Again, you have the two in-groups, you have the in-group and the out-group. And so basically what ends up happening is that not only is it, um, not only is it people's genuinely held values and perspective, it also becomes a kind of in-group, out-group thing, which is why it can be very difficult to approach these topics. And the more like schism there is in a society, the more there's gonna be an internal schism there. So basically when it comes to, let's say, let's say if somebody is on the left side of things and they hyper identify with being on the left and they're like, oh, I'm leftist and I have these values and these are my friends. And you know, this is the way that we view the world and this is the absolute right way to view the world. And you have someone on the right that's kind of saying the same thing. Like these are the people that I'm with and like, you know, things make sense this way. And basically what you have is you have essentially what was kind of happening with, uh, let's say the schism, you know, earlier on where there was two popes, what you have is you have these two popes in society, these two different ways of viewing things, two different kind of moral authorities, two different, uh, two different fundamental viewpoints. And what's happening is there's a bit of a culture war that occurs yes. between those two groups. And so basically, if you want to really get to a point where there is more of a unification. Unification can't really happen on the level of those two viewpoints. Unification can only happen if we go deeper underneath what actually informs both of those paradigms. And fundamentally, the way that I see the schism that's happening currently is that you basically, it's a little bit like when you see the splitting of a cell into two different, uh, into two different components. So like in the process of, I think it's called mitosis or meiosis, basically the cell pulls apart and becomes two, you know, so there's this schism that happens and it leads to future growth. And what I'm thinking is happening is that basically this is a way of like bringing things up from the societal shadow up to the forefront. It's creating a lot of conflict up here, but down here, there's more that's like rising up to the surface. And if we can look oh. at things in a non-ideological way, we can get up underneath what's what's up here. Mm -hmm. There's something I want to explore, a number of things actually. And I feel like, okay, I'll just get into it. Right, so you said that there's stuff coming up from beneath the surface, like there's water that's coming up out of it. But I suppose from each angle, it will look like what's coming out of there is a horrible monster. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And for the other angle, it's like, no, those, those are lovely angels. Those are monsters. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Um, and from a more holistic, mystical perspective, let's say, looking down, you see, you see a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. And I think this relates to the wounded masculine and the wounded feminine mm -hmm. and also consider that the both genders have both in them mm -hmm. Absolutely. now so i mean if you were to look at for example just an anti-feminist of some kind let's say there are men's right to this or something mm -hmm. right so and to say let's say for argument's sake they like they're into they want to do pickup artistry as well, that they're, they're interested in that, right? So that would be an example of the wounded masculine, right? And- Yeah, I suppose so. Like um, basically it would depend from person to person, the degree yeah, to the- Yeah, I'm kind of oversimplifying, but I'm just, I would like to weave something and you can tell me you, yeah, yeah, think of it. Sure. So, um, They've probably got maybe wounded feminine in them as well, but their relation to maybe they've got a um, an unbalanced uh, sacral chakra because that deals with sexuality and other people, right? And so it might either deal with if it was a more conservative sort of person, it might be stereotypically it might be more shame towards sexuality. If they were more, if they weren't so much conservative, it might be um you know hypersexual or it could be both at the same time in fact that's likely right and so they'll they'll feel loved if they succeed in seducing women Absolutely. right 
because they don't love themselves. And there's women in those same clubs who feel they are loved and are worthy if, if they sleep with a man, right? And so you get wounded people interacting in that way. Now, what happens with, for example, uh, I will say a radical feminist, but this won't necessarily, I don't want to besmirch them. So what I'll say is a, a radical feminist who doesn't act constructive about their values, right? Mm -hmm. Just as the, um, the mental rights therapist in this example might not act constructive about it because they might argue with feminists and say, no, we're, we're the victims. We've always been the victims because, I don't know, I got cheated on, blah, 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 right? Um, and then the feminists might, um, might actually have this wounded masculine energy to some extent. Absolutely. and wounded feminine and because of that combination as well even if they've got more feminine in them which is an assumption <laughs> they might actually feel a lot of a tendency to get in conflict with someone who believes the other thing the opposite position that there's the idea that if someone doesn't agree with the idea that there's a massive patriarchy that issue right they are a, a threat and basically nasty bigot because it's be like their shadow will be projected and the men's right activists will see their shadow projected and they will see they will see a fen fatal sort of figure who is accusing them of being a monster and they will feel hurt by that and they will feel like well so you're saying everything about what i am is wrong and broken and flawed and they will feel like oh, i'm gonna stand up for myself against this attack on who on men right and you get this whole exactly awful mess yeah um, for sure yeah absolutely yeah so basically when it comes to this dynamic that plays out it's basically projecting the inner uh the inner anima or animus onto the other person you know so the, the projection that I find most comes up, let's say, from the female perspective, so with the animus, is that it's like projecting the tyrant onto, you know, onto individual men and groups of men. And then for the man, it's this pedestaled woman, you know, it's the woman that's up on the pedestal that holds like male worth in her hand and can, like, if she says something not so nice, it hits this other chord because there's already an internal woman that's been pushed away, you know, and that kind of thing on the internal level. So basically with the animus, like when there's issues with the animus, it can really sour a woman or anyone with issues toward the masculine, really, toward men as a whole group. And sort of, there can end up being a bit of a projection in the same way that, you know, there can be a projection onto women, you know, the sense that, oh, like women are, like, what tends to be the projection there is women are up on a pedestal and they have this power over me and then like we have to kind of take them down off the pedestal which then of course feeds back into the system where the the women are projecting the animus that's the tyrannical animus and so basically it can end up in this external sense playing out what's going on internally for that person where the person is essentially using the other person is a projection screen for their inner opposite and so basically whenever a person let's say, is really, let's say, radical in their views, let's say, in either direction. So if you have, like, men's rights activists or you have, like, a very radical feminist, what can often happen is that instead of focusing toward the things that are actually about the societal things, you know, so let's say that if we focus on feminism, there are plenty of different issues that can be focused on that are, you know, genuinely constructive. If you look at men's rights activism, we can look at things like, you know, the court systems and, you know, how they favor the mom and that kind of thing. We can look at those things and we can say, okay, maybe there are some things that we can actually do on a practical level within society. But when you get that extreme polarization and these become these identities and these ideologies, what ends up happening is that then it's just this in-group, out-group thing again, kind of yeah, playing yeah. on that same level and that back and forth. And so basically it's playing out the internal issues on the external because of that identification and because of the projection that's happening on that more socio-political level. Okay. Um, yeah, we actually more or less agree there. Um, I'm going to introduce a, an idea I've had about 
I'll use this is relates to the left, le, so called, okay, the left wing identity politics idea of privilege, right? Now, for a long time, I was very against the the way it was conceptualized by theory in a theoretical basis and the way it, that was used in um, discourse, I suppose you could say. <clears throat> but now what I understand is that the issue I really had was, well, I, no, I won't say the issue I had. One, perhaps some use it as a way of, um, maybe there's um, projected shame or guilt in the term where we could have gratitude for how we're fortunate, right? Whether it's for being a certain gender or being having wealth or anything, right? Where you're fortunate and other people might not have that. We could be gra grateful, right? But some people might, because they're angry, they might point the finger when they say, oh, you're privileged or something. And then someone gets defensive and then all hope of actually having some sort of divide bridge just gone. Gotcha. So I would say that like when it comes to, let's say, concepts like white privilege or other concepts like that, I think we one of the things that would benefit us a lot is to be able to recognize the difference between something being like, let's say, uh, almost like a moral kind of thing and thinking about it just as, oh, this cause causes harm, you know? So like, for example, like, let's say if there's a situation where somebody has privilege um, over another person, and I also kind of think privilege is an interesting, like, and kind of not always the best way to frame it because sometimes it's privileged, like, oh, you have all this like extra money and disposable income and you're getting all these things that other people, the average person doesn't get. Other types of privilege are like, oh, you just, you know, you just don't get shot by the cops as often, you know, and so framing that as a privilege, it kind of, it lowers the bar a little bit, you know, so basically if people are treated poorly, you know, and to frame not being treated poorly as a privilege has its own problems in and of itself. But let's say if we take the idea of, of privilege, you know, we would be much better to look at it in the, uh, sort of a morally neutral sense like so in the sense where we can go okay what's going on with societal structures what's happening that's creating problems for certain groups of people you know like and basically let's take let, let's take an example that's like let's say at a distance from like where you and i are you know so basically there could be let's say another country where one group is treating another group very badly let's say there's apartheid in the country or something like that okay so basically in order to actually have people look at that issue, we have to, in some ways, take the shame element out of that, right? So we have to kind of get people almost like on the same side toward fighting against the problems, as opposed to saying like, you're the problem. And like, you know, it's because you're privileged that, you know, there's problem there. What happens is that an individual, and this comes back to that in-group and out-group kind of thinking, is that oftentimes what they're really identifying with is goodness to the exclusion of badness. So if there's a person's identifying with one in-group and this is the good in-group, and they're like, oh, I'm good, so I belong to this in-group, and that means I belong, whereas the other group, that's the bad in-group. And so that's our out-group. We don't want to belong to that because we're not bad, we're good. So at the crux of it is this fundamental human concern that all human beings are basically hardwired with to want to see themselves as good and- Or lovable. And lovable, absolutely, yeah. So what would be a more effective kind of way to look at things is to kind of take the, take the morality and the sense of good and evil out of it so that we can actually just see what, you know, take stock of what's going on. Are there certain systems that are running a particular way, you know, that we could actually improve things so that people aren't like kept down? You know, are there situations sure. that are coming up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is though, people can't always agree about even that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I, I do think that there are issues relating to the weird and masculine and feminine um, that play out with the anima animus kind of way. And I think that the reason definitely historically has been patriarchal norms mm -hmm. 
Uh, and um, as it's to use an example, and there's also been um, dehumanization of other ethnicities and so forth. However, I feel like that has been more symptomatic of energy than it has been truly the root cause. Because we can look at what's happening on the 3D, within the 3D hologram, and we're like, okay, there's all these problems. We need to solve these problems. But we can't solve the consequences of whatever is going on within each person. Okay, so it's like we are one collective, right? But we're like a, a disassociated collective. Yes. Rather than a unified collective, which is what we're moving towards, right? Mm -hmm. And so like within each of us is the same shadow in a way, kind of. Absolutely. And so there's all this stuff going on. And personally, I think maybe we need to actually take a step out of particular theories about what's going on on a political level. Because you can argue to the cows come home about that. And instead, we could focus on, well, healing and compassion and acceptance and understanding. And you might say, but this is unacceptable. Women are treated like this or, or, you know, men are treated like this or this systemic things going on and it's affecting the way we think. You know, conspiracy theorists talk about that as well. You know, the, 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 you know mind control from the Illuminati or something, right? There, there's no end to the amount of things that you could say. And you could say to someone, yeah, but, you know, this is going on, but they'll be like, no, that's going on. So personally, I think if we can actually focus on the spiritual healing aspect of things, and they might have a different perspective from me, but how can I find it in my heart to actually, what is that telling me about my own shadow? Mm -hmm. And then we go back to Jungian, um, and new age I, um, understandings again. So, yeah. So what I would yeah. say in regard to that is that basically, yes, everything is basically coming about in, in the way that I've been shown in my ayahuasca experiences and the way that I view things is because there is this disconnect between the masculine and feminine. And that has many, many different symptoms, essentially. And if we only focus up toward the symptoms, then there can be problems there. Because ultimately, if you try to resolve things on the level of the political system or on the level of social dynamics, what you're essentially going to end up with is that it's like cutting off the head of Hydra, where you essentially get more and more heads of the Hydra cutting off. And the more you resist on that symptomatic level, the more problems there are. Having said that, the way out is through. So like, instead of like, going d directly toward the masculine feminine, you kind of have to take a road down into the mix of things. And so the way that I see things, and especially in the course of the past hundred years with lots and lots of different societal shifts and things coming up to the surface, and especially now with that societal schism, what's happening is that we are getting very specific, almost instructions about how to heal that divide and to heal that split. So I would say that Yes, absolutely. What I've experienced is that it is this disconnection and this imbalance between the masculine and feminine. And in the third ayahuasca experience that I had, what I had this experience of was that I was this universe unto myself, and I was this representation of divine feminine. So I was standing in as the divine feminine in the experience. The divine masculine was across the room and out of alignment to me. So I could not connect to it. And I actually called one of the male facilitators over to me and I, I cried on his hands because it was just this real sense that there was a lot of wounding that was going on there. And through that, it's like given me this other perspective on what's happening now. And it's even though it's uncomfortable and even though it's creating a lot of issues and again, there's that in-group, out-group kind of thing, again, it's like the way out is through. It's like you have to go down through the shit of it and down into the into the core of what's happening. It's, it's okay because we're getting a lot of help, perhaps from the central sun or the galaxy or the sun or extraterrestrials or who knows, right? 
And in terms of just the energy, it's coming to us and it's bringing stuff up. <laughs> so yeah, it's great to go and explore the subconscious. Shadow work is really important, but it, it's shoved in our faces. Mm -hmm. Although what, whether or not people recognize that is another matter. So I'm picturing like this, there was this maze beneath the surface, right? And it rises up through the water. Then people are like stumbling around, clashing into, crashing into the walls and stuff. So um, in the face of all of this happening, like how do we grapple with the shadow and the self and the, the ego and uh, everything else? Well, another thing, like just in, in relation to what I experienced in my ayahuasca experience is that at a certain level, there is no distinction between self and anything else. And so the things that are happening internally for us and the things that are happening externally to us correspond. So in this sense, from a certain level, everything that's happening right now, socially, politically, and otherwise is an emanation of, of the self, you know, a self with a capital S. And so if we can think about the internal experience as reflective of that, but also the external experience as a mirror, we can think about things from like this viewpoint. And I like to do this exercise is okay. If I find something that I find objectionable, that's happening in the world, you know, or let's say a certain pattern that's happening that I don't care for happening, or it's creating a lot of like discomfort and triggering to me. It's like an indication that, oh, hang on a second. There's something being reflected to me externally that relates back to my internal schism, because at a certain point in time, that which is happening, that's a schism externally, that's which is a problem externally is an emanation of that internal thing. So if I look at the world and I go, okay, if everything is an emanation of the self and what's happening inside of me is creating all this political tension, is creating all of these problems in society, what does that mean that I need to deal with within myself? Yeah. Um... That's definitely a challenge. And we could speculate about like, you know, is it you? Is it the collective? Is there a difference between those two things? However, what I'd like to shift to is ways of navigating this on a personal basis. Mm -hmm. So relating to things like um, journal work, mm -hmm because that is kind of related to like Carl Jung's red book and black books. Um, dream work, which is also related, active imagination, and um, maybe meditation as well, and how they connect together in the context of everything we've talked about. Gotcha. So I suppose when it comes to active imagination, which is one of my favorite ways to do inner work, basically what it is, is that you are either recreating a dream scenario where like, let's say if, a, let's say, let's say if Yogi Bear popped up in my dream, maybe I might go and I might go back into that scene and have a conversation with Yogi Bear, ask Yogi Bear some questions, right? But I can also, uh, and, and basically this would give me certain insights about what that symbol means to me, what it's meant to represent in the psyche. And so basically everything that we experience gets internalized as a symbol, right? So let's say that if I take this to a more real world kind of context, not a dream context, and let's say that me and a family member of mine, right? Let's say that we're on opposite ends of the political spectrum and, and me and that family member, you know, we get into it and we get into this big fight and this big argument, right? What I can do is I can actually revisit that conversation and sort of explore through the process of active imagination what it was that that meant to me what that was a symbol for you know and what might have been coming up in me that like was being triggered up by that conversation so basically active imagination can be very useful for looking at like what our deeper motivations are and it can give us kind of an imaginary canvas where we can kind of work through things that we otherwise maybe wouldn't have the opportunity to work through and so we can kind of think about things in that sense of like whenever we are interacting with an 
it, let's say somebody, you know, an imaginary person, or you know, it's a projection of a real person that we know from life, but that's an imaginary projection of them. When we're engaging with that person or with that character that shows up in the dream, we're actually engaging with part of ourself, you know, and let's say, let's say that a person has a really fraught relationship with one of their parents. And so all the aspects of themselves that they relate back to their parents or see, you know, as similar to that parent is going to get pushed into the shadow. So whenever we have that conversation in active imagination, and let's say that the person is having a conversation with the parent that they have a lot of issues with, they're actually talking to the parts of themselves that been, have been repressed because of the, you know, the traumas that have maybe come along with that relationship. So doing active imagination really helps us connect with parts of ourself that have been um, kept back in the shadow. And so we can basically use that anytime we have a dream or anytime that we find ourselves in an uncomfortable situation where we have to work through and process through some things. Now with journal work, we can also kind of do, you know, something similar where we just start writing down our feelings, writing down our thoughts about things. And a lot of times it's like, instead of working out a complex math problem in the mind, you work it out on a piece of paper. So like, you know, if I could do much more complex math, like when I have it out on paper versus like trying to keep all the bits and pieces in my mind. And so journaling basically is about bringing um, bringing out a certain perspective, certain thoughts, certain feelings, and then having that out and being able to even respond to those things that are written on the page. And so basically it's kind of a way of like just exploring in, in a depth sense. Does that Can you combine out? both? Can you combine the two techniques? Oh, certainly you could. Yeah, absolutely. So basically there are written ways to do active imagination or more in the mind kind of ways. So if you wanted to do a journal of your active imagination, where you're kind of like writing a story where you're interacting with this person, that can create a lot of benefits there as well. Or you could do the active imagination in the more mind sense, and you could journal afterward about what, what you found out about, you know, basically, oh, these feelings came up in this situation, or these thoughts rose to the surface of the mind in that situation. So basically, you can utilize that... Um, uh, you can utilize those perspectives essentially, you know, in your journaling practice. So yeah, you could de definitely have a cross. Uh, and what about like recording into something and then listening to it and then I suppose lots of things could, I mean, you could, I just came to mind that you could basically for your own personal use, like record one thing, record another thing and then make like, I don't know, like a video of it, mm -hmm. uh, and then you could watch back it back. I, I don't know. This is there's all sorts of creative ideas as well where you can implement this idea. For sure. Um, and uh, well, I, I guess actually, why don't you continue uh, answer the question? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so basically, yeah, you have a lot of different inner work processes you can do. And basically, it's a situation where all, ro all roads kind of lead to Rome. You know, fundamentally, the parts of ourself that get put back in the unconscious, unrealized aspects of ourself they exist there in the shadow. Um, and then also the emotions that those aspects are experiencing kind of get numbed out in the body to where we're not experiencing those feelings fully. And so basically, whether you take active imagination or journaling or some other more intellect-based uh, method or meditation, particularly body scan meditation or some other somatically-based um, kind of uh, inner work process, yeah, it's a situation where it all kind of leads down to that same core of shining the light on parts of ourselves that we would otherwise have put in the shadow. And it's interesting that you brought up the body as well, because... A healer I've been talking to recently has brought to light this idea that there's different levels, right? There's the level of the mind and you can look at understanding either, pardon me, how the ego works. Mm -hmm. And um, I've got it very into the sort of analysis that um, Aaron Abke goes into about that, drawing on uh, the course of miracles and the law of one and stuff like that. And it's understanding how the ego works and that shining light on it. And there's the other techniques that you've gone into about how you can shine light on it, the light on it on a mental level, right? Then there's the physical stuff about, okay, what are you feeling where, like sensation wise, because that's a link to your emotions and, and where it is. And that might help you with chakras, understanding what you've got where, blocked where, I suppose. Absolutely. And any healing method you find, you can, I guess, integrate it together. But then there's stuff on the soul level, and I'm not sure 
how it fits together and then there's past life stuff so is that meditation we need to use to really unravel that yeah i would suppose so but basically when it comes to let's say the soul element of things I guess the way that I view it is that it's like the mind body complex that holds the like the particularities of this like lifetime, the traumas from this lifetime. And I know that, I mean, I've been to, let's say, I, I have been to a Reiki healer before that was talking about like some past life things. That's not something that I'm very well familiar with, but the idea that there's maybe if we can say that everything is an emanation of the source, right? So everything is like the one thing, but we could have sort of intermediary steps where let's say from source, there comes a variety of different souls and these souls live a variety of different lifetimes. And it basically, you know, it could be the case that like, like there's a soul that's living my life, but then it's also living someone else's life at the same time. Fundamentally, I think once you get back to a certain point, there's a kind of unification that starts to happen where there's like more of a connection to everything that is. So sort of like what I had experienced on ayahuasca where at a certain degree, healing myself was actually healing for, um, for everything. And so to heal on the individual level, in some ways like clicks into a more, let's say broad based healing. So let's say that uh, there's a soul and it lives the experience of many different experiences. And so let's say that, let's say a hundred people share the same soul. You know, on one level, if that person goes and does personal healing, the, the thing that's come across for me in that ayahuasca ceremony is that it fundamentally creates healing on this like broader level. So in, in the sense of like, you know, it's the same concept behind like generational healing and like an ancestral healing that heal yourself is to actually heal um, people going back in your family line. And so this is something that within the context of ayahuasca, there were some insights that came up about that. So I'm very open-minded to that, but I don't have a lot of awareness or experience. With oh, that okay. Myself. Two things. One is that I had this image in my mind of like ley lines, but instead of the earth's ley lines, it's ley lines between people. And if you heal one, it's like this green or healing energy branches out. And so you might find your friends start improving just because you're in a work without you sharing anything spiritual with them. Mm -hmm. For example, you might just say, well, I think they've, they've gone up in awareness. Now, maybe it's not you. Maybe it's something else. But that's an interesting factor. Another thing is you said ancestral energy, and that is something I've been aware of recently as well. I'm wondering how ancestral energy is transmitted, because I've got to feel, is it genetic or is it just through interaction with someone on the next generation level up that it just keeps going? So the impression that I've gotten, again, kind of drawing back to my ayahuasca experiences, is that it's more like it's more on an energetic level. So like, if you can imagine that, okay, you have a particular family and ultimately it like extends to the whole human family as well. But let's say that we have this collective human spirit and there's a particular like generational line that, you know, basically kind of not necessarily share the same spirit in this, like not really the concept that I was mentioning about everyone. Not the soul group sense, but yeah, in another group. sense. In another right. sense. Absolutely. So basically, if you can imagine that, let's say you have a group of people, let's say four or five generations back, and they experience some kind of famine or some kind of war or poverty or, you know, whatever it happens to be where there's an extreme trauma, that sort of is going to stay there until the people who have branched off of that line can kind of resolve it on that more energetic level. And so Basically, what can happen is it's a little bit like a wave that, that sort of ripples through generations. And the people who are in the initial part of the, of the trauma, the big trauma, you know, get the brunt of it. But you can even see that come through in like later generations. Now, in the generational trauma sense, in terms of the more experiential we can uh, pick up a lot on what's going on with our family. So, for example... I was just talking to a client the other day and they were talking about how their their grandmother had to, what's it they had to do? I think they had to flee and they were in some kind of wartime situation, you know, and like there was a lot of anxiety and there was the potential for death and all this kind of thing. And what they noticed is that their mom and their aunt, so their grandmother's daughters, you know, were very, very anxious, you know, maybe not being able to point it back to any particular thing that happened in their childhood, but almost in a sense of like, 
just having that proximity to that parent that's dealt with that trauma of like feeling anxiety because, you know, could be some kind of wartime situation, potential for death. And so it's like them picking up on things after the fact. And then my client basically kind of almost inheriting that sense of anxiety from their mom, from being around their mom, seeing and attuning to the way that their mom generally orients the world. Because whenever we're children, we're very well attuned to our caregivers because it's our caregivers who are protecting us, providing for us and that kind of thing. And so if we notice that our parent is always on edge, we're going to learn to always be on edge because what the parent's body language and way of orienting is implying is that something bad is about to happen. And so with, let's say, in the more generational, practical, experiential sense, I think that things can be picked up on there. From the perspective that I experienced from the ayahuasca, it was more of an energetic kind of like gash that would happen in the collective human spirit relative to that particular family, you know, and, and basically kind of uh, until that gash was resolved and healed, that it would continue to impact people in future generations down that family line. So, so basically just two different perspectives on that, one being the one that I experienced on, in ayahuasca and the other one that's more of a practical kind of thing. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, You're welcome. It's very interesting. And I've already got something else I'd like to ask, which is, is it possible that these, in, in each family, I mean, it might be different in some ways, like, is it possible that they kind of represent reversed tarot cards? Hmm, that's interesting. Or they could be explained, and maybe, because I know the law of one, it explains that the tarot cards are actually linked to the mind, body, and spirit in different ways. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, I mean, one case, it might be, I don't know, maybe, maybe with one, it might be just be the devil upright. I don't know, but, uh, or something, but in certain things it might be, I don't know, it might even be the minor arcana. I, I don't know, but I've just got this idea that you can symbolically represent somehow a particular kind of ancestral trauma. Mm -hmm. or maybe i'm trying to overly systemize it but it, it is interesting to me this idea like the lovers reverse might be a certain issue I, I don't know like what do you think yeah so i suppose if i'm gonna think about this um with regard to the um the tarot so if there is a journey that let's say you know let's say if we talk about things on the more um generational <sighs> practical kind of trauma you know ultimately the ma major arcana is meant to symbolize a type of journey and so in some sense journey in any sense archetypally is going to mean similar things whether it be a journey to um let's say overcome trauma or a journey to do any other thing and so what i'm imagining and the thing that I like the most about the tarot, particularly the Rider Waite tarot, is that there's a lot of archetypal imagery in the cards that kind of show what the accoutrements of a journey is. You know, so it starts with the fool, the foolish fool, the one that is bright eyed and bushy tailed and starts without any knowledge of the path ahead. They go to the magician and they get everything that they need to get, you know, in order to go on their journey. And then they go to the high priestess, you know, where there's an awareness of the shadow and an ability to hold space for dualism. And then they go to the empress, you know, and there's more of a connection to the earth and a grounding and, you know, maybe even dealing with the mother wound. And then they go to the you know, so basically with this, it shows a kind of journey that happens through the tarot. And I think on a certain level, because journey is kind of, there's sort of an archetype that all journeys kind of follow along. If you're aware of like Joseph Campbell's, um, you know, hero's yeah. journey, basically it's going to follow some set beats and steps. And so part of me thinks, and I haven't tried this out, that you could take any journey and you You could overlay the 20 teacher rich sort of an understanding of what's coming along with that journey. Yeah. Yeah. So basically like if we think about, let's say the fool, the one who is the zero card. So you can put the fool basically at the beginning of the major arcana. You can also put it at the end of the major arcana once you get to the world card. And basically the fool at the beginning is the foolish fool, the fool that goes in bright eyed and bushy tailed and basically comes to experience things for the first time. Then when he gets to the end of the major arcana, he's been at the end of his journey 
And at that point, he can either become jaded or he can come back into his fool nature, only this time as the wise fool, the fool that's experienced things fully. And so I suppose thinking about, let's say, the journey to healing, you know, let's say if, if let's say healing is the end of the journey, you know, ultimately there's this cyclical nature to how healing happens. And healing does tend to happen kind of in a spiral-like way where you deal with one element of it, you go through the journey and then you hit the same issue again on a different level and you go up the spiral one more. And basically it's until you end up transcending and spiraling up out of, of that trauma fully. Jung talked about this too. He, sorry, he had this, uh, I can't remember what it's called. He had this triangle or this diamond thing. It goes up in a triangle and then it goes down like that and then up like that. And, it, and then there's one with four different bits round in a circle, like the hero's journey. And that was just amazing. Um, I, I can't remember. He had these different representations of these different archetypal figures, like in the Bible uh, and stuff. Um I suppose that's related to it, isn't it? Yeah, I would suppose so. Yeah, basically, like when it comes to the journeys that we go through in life, you know, at any given time, we might be on four or five, six different journeys, just through different parts of the different spirals that we're learning in relation to. And so I suppose thinking about journeying as being another way to think about the individuation process, the process of unfurling the potential, it's ultimately it's through going through each of these journeys that we learn and that we gain wisdom. And basically, if we, um, if we're in a space where where we've been around the block so many times as we've spiraled up so many times we've explored into something so many times that we've gotten to a point where we're not down in the spiral we're more in a transcendent space relative to that spiral that comes up because the major arcana basically because you have the fool that travels around as a zero card once he gets to the end of the major arcana he can start back over go to the magician again and go through the other journey so yeah just in relation to like your original question is i think that you know, with the tarot, the tarot is a very powerful kind of language, you know, and it connects to a lot of like symbols that are going to be relevant to every person, you know, in varying degrees at different points in their life. And so to look at a tarot card and to kind of ask, how is this, how is this coming into my journey? Or how is this coming into my journey relative to my work life? Or how is this coming into my journey relative to relationships could be very helpful. Well, particular traumas will have their own midway through the journey in the hero's journey there's link something linked to the dark night of the soul where there's this big crisis happens and everything seems screwed and then they find this hidden secret within given what they were told before or some big uh, secret weapon or something right and then they manage to win but i imagine so maybe every time you're trying to heal um maybe a reversed card or a wounded card or what something like that you could basically well suppose it's a reverse card but it's basically you start maybe you turn it onto its side halfway through but at the end you've got like the what was it the, the dragon you need to fight the dragon at the end which is like represents like the final confrontation with it and then maybe that is where you, you get it face up again but in the next cycle you'd have to deal with some other issue that you haven't dealt with yet and but you've got like you said maybe it's like these different strands at the same time absolutely yeah most definitely and i think you know relative to anything like this so if i think about let's say my life personally let's say i'm on a journey with my my work life you know like in terms of like i you know i want to continue to grow my channel and, and continue to get a broader reach so like that's one journey that i'm on I'm also on a journey relative to personal relationships you know like so for example like i've dealt with a lot of like hermit like tendencies and kind of being to myself and so this part of my journey is really about how do I get back reconnected with other people? What are the things that I have resistance to that's maybe stopping that from happening? And so if I like apply, let's say, certain cards within the tarot, you know, so let's say, um, or let's go specifically major arcana. And let's say I run into a reversal of the death card, you know, in my reading relative to, um, let's say, my, uh, 
let's say my issues with like connecting with people and being a little bit socially isolated is that maybe there would be a fear of death or fear of change that's like impeding my ability to have that connection. And so potentially if I'm in a space where I'm dealing with that part of the journey, it's being able to open myself back up to connection in spite of the fear of loss of other people. Because a lot of times people, when they end up, let's say, closing themselves off to connection. What they're trying to do is they're trying to contract themselves so they don't get connected to anyone, so they don't lose anyone. So that might be part of the journey. And I might come up against the same issue again. Oh, I'm you know socially isolating again. Oh, I thought I got past this when I dealt with the death issue. But now it's like, the, you know, now the judgment card comes up and it's like, oh, actually, like, I'm afraid of being judged by other people. I'm afraid of being ostracized. And now I have to deal with that part of the spiral. Oh. And so basically, you know, you can use any card actually within the tarot to kind of act as a viewfinder to whatever you're going through in your personal journeys and your experiences. And I've just found it very helpful in that sense. Okay. So, um, yeah, um, I've noticed that you do actually have a lot of um, what I mentioned, the innovative methods for um, tarot readings on your website. One of the services you provide is an in-depth look at um, the shadow mm -hmm. of the client with regard to the tarot. Um, I don't know whether or not you consider their MBTI, MBTI in the whole process, but in any case, like, it's interesting. It does look quite honestly. I, I think um, it's something I might want to do one day because I do tarot as well. Uh, and if I could actually really integrate understanding of the shadow and stuff like that into it, that that would be really interesting. Um, so, or yeah, use it or to help use it to help explore the shadow. So yeah. Uh, and combining that to hero's journey, which is ultimately what the tarot is all about. It's just, I love it. I love how connected it all is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like, like the background behind you. Oh yeah. The different connections are different. There's like some sacred geometry back there. Yeah. And behind you, it's like, there's a sun. Actually, there's oh, like yeah, another number of them. Yeah. I see that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the tarot is really wonderful in the sense that it's a little bit like it's a mix and match myth, you know, so in the sense that you could read the myth of Sisyphus, you know, or the, the, the myth of the goddess Inanna and this kind of thing, and you get this archetypal meaning and it tracks on to things in your day to day life, you know, things that are very practical understandings, a lot of wisdom held in those myths. So, you know, so for example, with Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill, it's how do you content yourself with let's say the temporality of the things that we create in our existence and, and this kind of thing. So with the tarot, particularly the wider Rider weight, which is why I really like this deck, I'm kind of a little bit married to the Rider weight deck, is that it's chock full of archetypal symbolism. And so what you have is basically a visual mix and match myth. And so you put out a few tarot cards and you can kind of read it as a story and see how that story, the tarot story that you've pulled, relates back to the things that's going on internally for you or externally for you. And it gives you just this more narrative visual way of looking at things as opposed to more logical linear ways. And so yeah. it gives us new perspectives. So for example, if I pull up, uh, let's say the temperance card, you know, so what that shows is there's an angel that's pouring water from one cup to another. And just in knowing what temperance means, it means like tempering things out. Um, also, we're noticing that the wings are really supporting most of the weight because they're not, they have their toes dipped in the water and they have toe, uh, the other foot just lightly resting on, on land. And so while there's a connection to earth and water, which represents the more mundane elements of life in terms of the earth and the water representing the emotions, there is something that is beyond the, the physical realities of, you know, the mind and the body and, you know, what's going on here that's anchoring us into something else. And that's allowing this angel to have this temperance. We also notice they have a triangle right on their gown. It's facing up. Is that the fire sign? Uh, I'm not 100%. Was it there? That's a good question. I didn't think about it. In the I'm thinking of the alchemical symbols mm -hmm. or so. <laughs> I don't know. I, I am aware of them. I just don't know which one goes with which. So I should, right. I should learn that. 
though. But basically, like when it comes to, let's say, the triangle, the triangle um, is, is the most stable shape because it's skinny on top and like wide on the bottom. So there's that sense of stability that comes here. And so if I pull this card in my reading, I might look at my life and go, is there any sense of like needing to create more stability? Or is there anything that I'm not being particularly temperate with? And I can sort of start to look at the imagery of the card in relation to things happening in my life. So if I find that, oh yeah, I'm really unstable in, let's say, in relationship to relationships, right? And so what is it that the cards may be suggesting that I do? It's like, well, the water represents the emotions. It's like, you know, I have to take my emotions in good measure. I can't just let myself be overwhelmed by my emotions. I have to have my toes dipped in the water. You know, I have to be aware of my emotions. I have to be grounded. But I also can't let myself drown in the water. So I have to use my emotions as an input, but I can't get so swept up in them that I become non-temperate. And there's also in the card, let's say there's like a little pathway that looks like it's leading back to like this ovally looking sun and then like these mountains. And so it's like, oh, is there some kind of path that I have to take to become more temperate? Are there certain steps that I need to take that are maybe a little bit um, of an elevation in relation to what I'm currently doing. So is there anything practical that I need to add in? Um, is there any emotion that I'm specifically trying to avoid? And that's like why this is becoming overwhelming or that the emotions become so intense that I'm not able to be temperate with them. So I can start looking at the card and asking myself different questions in relation to the card. And this gives me a little bit of a viewfinder to maybe get a glimpse at what's going on in the unconscious that I wouldn't typically look at. Okay, now I, I have a sense that we should think about finishing soon, but there's one more thing I'd like to request of you. And it's um, uh, this idea that could you brief, well, uh, briefly when it comes to doing tarot readings anyway, do like a little reading for maybe energy from ancient civilization like Atlantis and Lemuria and if it's coming up now at the end of this grand cycle and would that be interesting I, see. I can do my best with that and see what comes up and see if it resonates if with you if you'd rather not that's okay that's fine i can give it a shot i do have to go in just a little bit though but but basically yeah let me go ahead and i will let's say pull oh hang on and one second, I have a client that's, I, I told him I'd be available at 3.30. Um, I'll just let me, oh. let me let him know real quick. Maybe we could do another interview and we do it, um, <laughs> and we could do it in that. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, one second. All right, so there we go. Okay, I'll go ahead and I'll pull three different tarot cards and see what comes up. Okay, all right, so one, two, three. So the first card we have is the two of cups. The second card is the two of wands. Oh, so we got lots of twos coming up. And then we have the king of swords. So let's see, with the first card here, what we have is we have a man and a woman who are facing one another and they're holding cups up together. And basically it's about the connection between two people, you know, so the cups having to do with the element of water, which again has to do with the emotions, the subconscious, the intuition. So here we have two people that are kind of sharing emotionally and there's this connection that's coming in between them because of this connection. So basically with all the two cards, there's this element of dualism and the dualism can either work together you know it's the dualism of the high priestess it can either work together and be very harmonious like in the case of the two of cups or it can be a little bit more uh, fraud so we have this connection here between uh, let's say we could say in general two people a man and a woman or we could say it's the connection between the masculine and feminine which you had alluded to earlier on in the Thing. So if we think about that in relation to ancient civilizations, is that maybe there was more of a connectivity between these two elements of the self, like on the internal level, the masculine and feminine side, or also between individual people, there was more of a connection between the masculine and feminine. So again, it's the sharing of emotions, like so emotions and like, you know, being able to really be vulnerable and to like, give your cup of emotions to the other person almost like that maybe this could be a reflection of things that had come before. Now we have the two of wands and I'm almost reading this as being like, this is like what was in the past. Now we're in this situation where there's this guy, he's up in the tower 
and he's got one wand that's connected to the castle that he's in and he's got the other wand in his hand and he's overlooking outside of the castle kind of asking the question should i stay or should i go so again like the other two card we have this sense of dualism this sense of being pulled in two different directions so where the two of cups has this communion between the two the two of wands has this sense of there being kind of a conflict between the two do i stay up in my tower nice and safe or do I go out into the world where things might not be so safe? And so the wands have to do with the element of fire. And the element of fire has to do with change, transformation, growth, and trailblazing new paths. And so he's kind of making this decision. Do I stay the course of like staying safe up in my tower where I'm elevated and disconnected from everything? Or do I go out and do I set foot on land? And do I explore things externally? But if you notice, he's looking at this little globe in his hand that's all yellow and red. And as we know, globes are, you might have some yellow and red in them, but generally they're blue and green. And so it's suggesting that he has overemphasized certain elements of the world. And this is coming into his worldview. And it's his worldview that keeps him up in the tower, trying to be safe from the world, when in reality, he's trying to be safe from very specific elements of the world that he's now woven together as meaning this is the whole entirety of the world. And so he's in this position of making the decision, do I stay up safe in my tower or do I go out into the world? Only his worldview isn't so accurate. And so he's making that decision based off of something that's not grounded in the actual realities right. of the world, but grounded maybe in his previous traumas. And that's why he's staying up in the tower safe. So if I take this as a reflection of, let's say, where we currently are, it's the sense of there being like an element of safety and protection that is maybe not allowing us to be vulnerable, that's keeping us all kind of isolated, kind of up in our tower, not having that sense of emotional connection, as was shown in the two of, of cups, and basically creating a kind of schism within the dualism as opposed to an integration and a connection in the dualism. And so that's sort of how I could read that in relation to maybe what was before. And this is just a guess because I'm not so familiar, but. Here's an idea. Is it possible that with the two of wands, that separation issue is, or distorted perspective is a bit like maybe what caused problems like the fall of Lemuria and the fall of Atlantis? Maybe. It could potentially be, you know. Maybe so there's a similar sort of solution, maybe relating to the third thing. I don't know. Absolutely. So if we think about what this is, basically the third card is the King of Swords. So basically what we have is we have a masculine ruler archetype with a masculine principled suit. So the swords is uh, reflective of the element of air, which is a masculine suit. And basically it has to do with thoughts, ideas, beliefs, values, judgments, everything of the mental life. And so because he is the masculine ruler archetype within a masculine suit, he's a king that's in his element, meaning that he takes the primary Primary, um, primary perspective within this suit. Whereas let's say the queen of cups would have the primary perspective within the cup suit because water is a feminine element. <sighs> and so basically him being the ruler of the, the swords as a suit, he is somebody who is a master of thought, a master of mental frameworks and thinking about things a particular way. So if you can imagine mm. that there are skillful ways to think about things and there are unskillful ways to think about things and the way that we think about things really impacting those outcomes. You know, so for example, if I take on the perspective, if I take the facts of my life and I say, oh, I've experienced this trauma and it means I'm broken and that I'm never gonna amount to anything, that's a thought pattern that can lead to some very unskillful and negative results. Versus if I say, oh, I've experienced all of these traumas and that's true, but oh, that makes me more resilient. You know, that's a more skillful way to think about things. And so with the King of Swords in this case, if there is this schism between, let's say, staying safe and going out in the world, it's ultimately it's changing the ideas that lead to this more distorted worldview. So ultimately- So the thoughts, yeah, it depends. The thoughts can either make or break break it for you and they'll affect how you see the world mm -hmm. and and so it highlights the problem that has happened and is happening but also a potential solution at the same time exactly yeah so it's like rearranging the framework so that 
this isn't as scary. And so that we're not keeping ourselves up in our towers and worried about what this is. Because ultimately that little globe that's red and yellow that he's holding is just thoughts, you know? It's oh, the like, two, the spiraling between the two cup and masculine and feminine, the first card we hit pulled, the mm -hmm. two of cups, that can become, if they merge, you, maybe what you get is the ace of cups. Mm -hmm. Oh, potentially. Yeah. So some renewal, some something, you know, coming from it that's like a new cycle. And it's spiraling up like the um, Kundalini mm -hmm. or something. Absolutely. Yeah. So, but basically what I see as like, you know, the first card I'm kind of seeing as a reflection of maybe what was before, before there was much more of a connection and much more of a a smooth existence between the yin and yang within individuals and within societies at large, you know, where both of those principles were coming together and working together, like almost like two yoked oxen that are like working, you know, in tandem going the same direction versus having one ox go over this way and the other ox go over that way and creating a lot of tension. And so with this, it's like the reconciliation between opposites, whereas this is sort of like this torn, not sure if I should stay or sh I should go because of maybe past experiences and beliefs that have been adopted from past experiences that then leads to a kind of schism about like, oh, I need to stay up isolated and safe in my tower. Or maybe there's an urge to go out and to set foot on the ground, but it's like, because of the thought process is there, that becomes too scary of a situation to face with because we're afraid of being hurt. So changing our ideas and our beliefs about things like the King of Swords can be very helpful for opening up new possibilities because our framework for viewing things can very much edit out, you know, any possible solutions that we might be able to utilize. And I think right now, just in general, the way that I see society as working and in terms of just all the conflicts that are coming up in terms of like all the, you know, the political strife, I think what it is is that there are let's say new thought forms emerging and then there's new ways of viewing things that are emerging as well and it's an uncomfortable process with like a lot of growing pains but it's at the same time it's almost like this chaos is like the birthplace to new paradigms and ways of thinking and, and that's absolutely yeah um <clears throat> and some people have talked about gaia having birth right now um so yeah honestly yeah. this was a fantastic interview i really enjoyed it awesome awesome i enjoyed it as well yeah, so I'd definitely like to talk to you again, but you've probably got somewhere to go. And maybe to the viewer, maybe you've got somewhere to go as well. I don't know. <laughs> um, so to everyone involved, including myself, uh, have a great day or a great evening. And um, see you in the next one then. All right. All right. Um, see you then. Bye. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure.